My name is Daniela Fernandez. I'm the founder and CEO of Sustainable Ocean Alliance, a global organization that empowers young people to develop ocean solutions. And today we have partnered with Limblad Expeditions to bring entrepreneurs, investors, mentors on one of uh, Limblad's vessels to see all the problems that our environment is facing. It's really great to be here in Southeast Alaska with SOA, uh, Sustainable Ocean Alliance, and, and all these young entrepreneurs and, and, and young leaders and mentors. We've gone out and explored, watched salmon uh, work their way upstream. We've been kayaking and hiking, and I hope that everybody leaves inspired by what they saw, and it helps them in their endeavors going forward. Today, the National Geographic Seabird is in the lovely town of Petersburg. We arrived in a foggy and eerie morning coming into the fishing port, and we've come here today to visit a salmon cannery. This is Tonka Seafoods. Uh, we do uh, several different kinds of processing here. Uh, we are a value-added seafood company. Uh, we do a lot of smoked product. Uh, we do retort pouches, which we'll show you in cans. We also do shrimp here. Uh, we are seeing some, some real changes in, in our fisheries here in southeast Alaska. The natural runs are, are suffering because of ocean conditions. Our biologist here is telling us that we're getting enough escapement because they're being very cautious about the fisheries. Enough escapement up the stream to produce the next run, but uh, they're producing plenty of small smolt coming out and they're going out onto ocean and they're not coming back. But it is out there, ocean conditions have changed to a point where it's affecting the runs. This year we're seeing probably more uh, climate change problems than we've seen ever. It was an incredible experience. I'd be honest enough, you read online, you read about the horrors of like wild fishing, oh, it's not a good thing or so on. But you actually come here, see the process, understand all the differences, the pros and cons, and what's really happening at the very bottom of the food chain uh, really opens up a huge amount of possibilities in terms of innovation in the ecosystem that how can you benefit the people who are involved? Uh, how can you know, this whole thing be better and more sustainable? This afternoon, we'll have the opportunity to visit a small salmon hatchery. 600,000 are going to be released right here. 500,000 go to an eight bay, which is south of Wrangell. We are at the Crystal Lake Fish Hatchery, and what happens here is king salmon are designed and imprinted to return here where they can be milked, the eggs removed, fertilized, hatched, kept for a year to reduce predation and then released back into the wild. So it's doing what happens naturally, but it has a higher percentage effectiveness. We have uh, one, two, three guided fishery businesses that rely on these king salmon. Also a lot of community, this is where they get their salmon for the winter or the smoke because the wild stock is really having is struggling and so there was no wild king salmon fishery this year the only king salmon fishery we had was out in this designated area for where these fish are returning pretty amazed <laughs> these guys have worked hard to get here this is pretty cool i don't know a lot of making real of this whole story of the salmon that we've all heard so much of right but it's hard to see it in, in person until you come to Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> After the fog lifted, we were surprised by this beautiful sunny day. It's been a fantastic day to explore this wonderful Norwegian fishing village. Most of the boats are actually out in the water plying for salmon at this time, but it doesn't take away from the charm of the area. And today we'll, we'll finish our wonderful um, time here with a delicious crab feast. Yeah. 
We're traveling up Tracy Arm towards South Surrey Glacier. Just a little bit ago, we crossed the bar, which is the terminal moraine of the glaciers that came down this fjord. It's spectacular landscape, large granite domes and a beautiful U-shaped valley, turquoise water, quite an exquisite landscape that we're traveling through on our way towards South Sawyer Glacier. One, two. These angles of light all have different meaning at this one point in time. It keeps changing based on how the sun is rising and how we're moving against the fjord. Like, it's just so dynamic. It's insane. It's amazing. Welcome everybody to Tracy Arm. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. We don't get days like this every day. And uh, it's a magnificent place. It's all glacially carved. And we're going to go towards the glacier. Okay, we got an extra passenger joining our Zodiac cruise. It looked like a young dark-eyed Junko. Uh, I saw it just go whoop, boom, and landing in the water. So, Let's see, let's put him in a warm place. Like, well, kind of more like body warm. Like maybe, <laughs> maybe there for a little bit. And uh, in a little bit, I'll just go ashore and uh, put it on where it's supposed to be. When we see icebergs that are really big in comparison to others those are usually produced as shooters they they snap off from the underwater base of the glacier and they float so you can see that the the surface that's white has suffered some cracking and the surface that is blue has the same bubbles but they're completely compressed so that's why you don't see the bubbles and the eyes looks blue this is a good angle to see the the blue color wow. This is That's crazy. <laughs> and remember, we're seeing only about uh, one tenth of the whole size. We are here in South Sawyer Glacier at the end of Tracy Arm. There's a harbor seal in the water there. They're super shy. There's another one in front of us. There was. Maybe we'll get to hear things that sound like cracks that are pieces falling from the top and landing on the water, making a big pow. That sounds like a crack, but it's actually an impact. We've witnessed some really good calving here in Tracy Arm. We saw South Sawyer uh, dropping some pieces from the face. And this is a normal process when the ice of upper layers is pushing the lo lower layers. On a tight water glacier, it's normal for the pieces to fall off from the face. Oh. There's a ballistic ice flying. It's gonna keep going. We are in a period of time where the earth is warming up and the calving is a little bit more common. We don't get advancing glaciers, but we get retreating glaciers. There's less snow feeding the ice fields and therefore the calving is not replaced and the glaciers retreat. Yeah, there it goes, there it goes. There it goes. Oh my god! Awesome, we can now go back to the ship. That's crazy! <laughs> <laughs> I can't found that. Oh! Oh, oh he went. Sorry. Sorry, I woke you up. So you'll notice that they are sitting on the ice yeah. and their head is up and their tail is up as well. They're trying to reduce that surface area with the ice to save heat. Yeah, do you want Bailey's or Peppermint Sharks in it? Bailey's? Bailey's. <laughs> I want some Bailey's. Cheers. 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 This is like life right here. Bailey's and Glacier and chocolate. I'm the happiest person in the world. Cheers to life and Glacier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The dark-eyed junko, we picked it up from the water and uh, it's looking better now. 
I think it's gonna make it. It's exercising. I think it's gonna make it. I'm a little distracted here with too, too many things going. Oh, there he goes. So we've got some humpback whales, and we are in uh, at the end of Endicott Arm, where there's a lot of nutrients due to some upwelling. These whales are here feeding. Whales live in a world of sound, and they can navigate quite accurately, and uh, they can go to Hawaii and back to the same exact spot where they were the year before. And uh, it's not well understood. There's no uh, hard science on how they do it. But uh, because they live in a world of sound and they have a very good perception of their, the world where they live, they can certainly know that we are here. We well are together and uh, they are having some sort of interaction. And remember, there are more things about them that we don't know than the things we actually know. Why they're doing this is really hard to tell. Four humpbacks that were just uh, greeting us right off the boat, all swimming together. We don't quite know what they were doing, but they were showing off their their backs, their small dorsal fins, their flukes, and making a lot of uh, a lot of fun noises for us. I think we're making some good noises for them too with our oohs and ahs. unused ideas, a lot of discarded post-its and charts. The goal of SOA in bringing together amazing ocean technology entrepreneurs, investors, mentors, partners, and ocean experts is to help these entrepreneurs accelerate their ideas. Introducing Seaweed Swim, so basically a new front line. Um, we have expertise, we have scientists, we have policymakers, we have people here that can uh, challenge the ideas of the entrepreneurs and help them improve upon so they can get back to Silicon Valley and, um, and scale up uh, their, their ideas. But when we're all together, we have so many different amalgamations, so how can we make them all work together? What is our common goal? We'll also have uh, different workshops from IDEO around design thinking. Uh, we'll have pitch practice from our storytellers to understand how can we translate an engineering machine into having the world uh, realize that we need a larger, more complex solution to help address some of these very, very um, massive problems. Somehow we have to convey the importance of the oceans to the entire 7 billion people that live on this planet. So far we've seen amazing, amazing partnerships uh, develop and evolve. Uh, we've seen some entrepreneurs find mentors on the ship. Um, we've seen some entrepreneurs talk about collaborating. I mean, if one entrepreneur has an idea and the other one can help scale it in a different way, it's magical what happens when you put people together on an expedition, such as a Limblad expedition, um, where you see magic happen happening every single day. We're at the north end of Chichigoff Island, just south of Indian Strait. We're going to spend the morning exploring Port Althorp and the temperate rainforest of this area. The temperate rainforest of the Pacific Northwest is comprised predominantly of Sitka spruce, western hemlock, and some understory, which consists of Devil's Club, and a variety of other shrubs that bear berries in the late summer. So we're seeing a salmon stream. These salmon are returning from several years of living in the salt water into the fresh water to spawn, after which point they will die. And hopefully many of those eggs will return to the salt water and continue this life cycle. Yeah, we've been in the drought this summer and because of that, the streams don't have a lot of water flowing in them later in the year, like right now when a lot of the snow has melted. So these fish are dealing with a really shallow situation and having a hard time making it up to their spawning grounds. And just to see the whole ecosystem here with half the fish on the rock bar, the females waiting to lay their eggs and men fighting for position. It's pretty crazy. It's amazing to see it.
Welcome all of you here to the Indian Islands. We're in a spot called Cross Sound. It's a narrow area and anything that's coming and going from these two bodies of water in the northern part of the Inside Passage has to come through Cross Sound. We're talking about the current has to come in and out, the tidal influence comes in and out. It can crank through here, you know, 15, 20 knots. Because of that current and those tidal influences, you have all kinds of nutrient upwelling and transfer that's occurring, which means that you have a lot of biological productivity occurring here, which means we can find a lot of different animal species here. It's eating about a quarter of its body weight a day. So 20, 25 pounds a day it could be eating. And sea otters are almost always uh, floating on their backs. Very, very common to see that. Some parts of its body, the amount of hair exceeds a million hairs per square inch. This is the spot where all of that cross current nutrient exchange takes place. This is the stellar sea lion or the northern sea lion. And this is the largest of the eared seals. And this guy here, <laughs> Kind of looks a little like Jabba the Hutt here. When we watch them, look at their four flippers. They're able to actually rotate, externally rotate out those four flippers and use them to almost walk across the land. And they can do the same thing with their hind flippers as, as well. So they can rotate them out and use them to, to be pretty ambulatory across the land. You get the idea why they're called sea lions when you hear them roar like that. Deep guttural sounds. Even though they're not gonna be mating for a while, I mean, they're ready to mate, they just are not gonna have the opportunity because there's males out there that are much, much larger than they are. Sometimes if you're a really big dominant male, maybe you have three years where you're gonna have the chance to actually chase other males away and mate with females, so. So my name is Coulter Barnes. I am the homesteading resident for Indian Islands Institute. And we are at the Hobbit Hole. And we are a field school that focuses on uh, environmental sustainability, environmental sciences, education, and research. And um, so we host student groups throughout the year. Uh, they come here from one week to one month to learn about, uh, uh, I guess it's experiential living and learning here at Southwest Alaska, so or Southeast Alaska. I would live here. I would live here with apparently like 17 other people since that's how many bunks there are. I think it would get kind of crowded. This is I mean, this is paradise. There's no other way to put it. Good morning. It's a beautiful day here in Chatham Strait, Southeast Alaska. Woke up cruising the shore for wildlife and we just happened to find a little black bear walking around. Right now we're on our way down to Worm Springs to pick up Dr. Andy Zabo and we're on the hot lookout for, for whale activity. Well, it's hard to believe a week has gone by and we've seen so, so much and tasted some of the finest wildlife and nature that Alaska had to offer. Alaska affects everybody differently. For some people, it's the whales. For some people, an otter. For some people, it's the magnificent scenery or the ice. But one thing's for sure, for this week, it was absolutely life-changing. And a big part of that was having Sustainable Ocean Alliance on board this ship. All of us have learned so much from you and we hope that you've taken a bunch home from Alaska as well. Oh my God, it's been just incredible. We've seen so many things from glaciers to whales. It's things that you would, you would never imagine you could see um, or that have been on bucket lists for people for decades. We were able to see all in one trip, so it's been awesome. I hate going outside 
and I'm a big like nerd who loves urban concrete jungles. For me, I came to this with tons of skepticism, being like, okay, it'll be productive for like Finless, and it'll be like fun to be with people on the boat. But this is like the first time I've ever been like, man, nature is actually really, really cool. I'm gonna really miss this, <laughs> but I guess I have no flukes left to give. Best massage Woo! of my life. Yes. Did it make it? <laughs> Did you record that? Yeah. Ah, cool. I love this. <laughs>